Hello, thank you for joining me. We've been reading through A Course in Miracles, the main text. And today we will resume after our break for the holidays and we'll pick up where we left off. So we are reading chapter 21, Reason and Perception. And uh, we're in section three today, the responsibility for sight. We have repeated how little is asked of you to learn this course. It is the same small willingness you need to have your whole relationship transformed to joy. The little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit for which he gives you everything, the very little on which salvation rests, the tiny change of mind by which the crucifixion is changed to resurrection. And being true, it is so simple that it cannot fail to be completely understood. Rejected, yes, but not ambiguous. And if you choose against it now, it will not be because it is obscure, but rather that this little cost seemed in your judgment to be too much to pay for peace. This is the only thing that you need do for vision, happiness, release from pain, and the complete escape from sin, all to be given you. Say only this, but mean it with no reservations, for here the power of salvation lies. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience, and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. Deceive yourself no longer that you are helpless in the face of what is done to you. Acknowledge but that you have been mistaken and all effects of your mistakes will disappear. It is impossible the Son of God be merely driven by events outside of him. It is impossible that happenings that come to him are not his choice. His power of decision is the terminer, the determiner of every situation in which he seems to find himself by chance or accident. No accident nor chance is possible within the universe as God created it, outside of which is nothing. Suffer and you decided your sin was your goal. Be happy and you gave the power of decision to him who must decide for God for you. This is the little gift you offer to the Holy Spirit, and given this, he gives you to yourself. Sorry, he gives you, he gives to you to give yourself. For by this gift is given you the power to release your Savior, that he may give salvation unto you. Begrudge not then this little offering, withhold it and you keep the world now as you see it. Give it away and everything you see goes with it. Never so much given for so little. Let me read that one again. Never was so much given for so little. In the holy instant is this exchange affected and maintained. Here is the world you do not want brought to the one you do. And here, the one you do is given you because you want it. Yet for this, the power of your wanting must first be recognized. You must accept its strength and not its weakness. You must per perceive that what is strong enough to make a world can let it go and can accept correction if it is willing to see that it was wrong. The world you see is but the idle witness that you were right. 
this witness is insane. You trained it in its testimony and gave it back to you. You listened and convinced yourself that what it saw was true. You did this to yourself. See only this and you will also see how circular the reasoning on which you're seeing rests. This was not given you. This was your gift to you and to your brother. Be willing then to have it taken from him and be replaced with truth. And as you look upon the change in him, it will be given you to see it in yourself. Perhaps you do not see the need for you to give this little offering. Look closer then at what it is and very simply see it in the whole exchange of separation for salvation. All that the ego is, is an idea that it is possible that things should happen to the son of God without his will and thus without the will of his creator, whose will cannot be separate from his own. This is the son of God's replacement for his will, a mad revolt against what must be, must forever be. This is the statement that he has the power to make God powerless, and so to take it for himself and leave himself without what God has willed for him. This is the mad idea you have enshrined on, upon your altars and which you worship. And everything that threatens this seems to attack your faith, for here is it invested. Think not that you are faithless, for your belief and trust in this is strong indeed. The Holy Spirit can give you faith in holiness and vision to see it easily enough. But you have not left open and unoccupied the altar where the gifts belong, where they should be. You have set up your idols to something else. This other will, which seems to tell you what must happen, you give reality. And what would show you otherwise must therefore seem unreal. All that is asked of you is to make room for truth. You are not asked to make or do what lies beyond your understanding. All you are asked to do is let it in. Only to stop your interference with what will happen of itself simply to recognize again the presence of what you thought you gave away. Be willing for an instant to leave your altars free of what you placed upon them and what is really there you cannot fail to see. The holy instant is not an instant of creation but of recognition. For recognition comes of vision and suspended judgment. Then only is it possible to look within and see what must be there, plainly in sight and wholly independent of interference and judgment. Undoing is not your task, but it is up to you to welcome it or not. Faith and desire go hand in hand for everyone believes in what he wants. We have already said that wishful thinking is how the ego deals with what it wants to make it so. There is no better demonstration of the power of wanting and therefore of faith to make its goals seem real and possible. Faith in the unreal leads to adjustments of reality to make it fit the goal of madness. The goal of sin induces the perception of a fearful world to justify its purpose. What you desire, you will see. And if its reality is false, you will uphold it 
by not realizing all the adjustments you have introduced to make it so. When vision is denied, confusion of cause and effect becomes inevitable. The purpose now becomes to keep obscure the cause of the effect and make appear, effect appear to be a cause. This seeming independence of effect enables it to be regarded as by standing by itself and capable of serving as a cause of the events and feelings its marker thinks it causes. Earlier, we spoke of your desire to create your own creator and to be father and not son to him. This is the same desire. The son is the effect whose cause he would deny. And so he seems to be the cause producing real effects. Nothing can have effects without a cause, and to confuse the two is merely to fail to understand them both. It is as needful that you recognize you made the world you see as that you recognize that you did not create yourself. I'm going to read that sentence again. It is as needful that you recognize you made the world you see as that you recognize you did not create yourself. They are the same mistake. Nothing created not by your creator has any influence over you. And if you think what you have made can tell you what you see and feel and place your faith in its ability to do so, you are denying your creator and believing that you made yourself. For if you think the world you made has power to make you what it wills, you are confusing son and father effect and source. The son's creations are like his father's, yet in creating them, the son does not delude himself that he is independent of his source. His union with it is the source of his creating. Apart from this, he has no power to create. And, that he, and what he makes is meaningless. It changes nothing in creation, depends entirely upon the madness of its maker and cannot serve to justify the madness. Your brother thinks he made the world with you. Thus he denies creation. With you, he thinks the world he made made him. Thus, he denies he made it. Yet the truth is you were both created by a loving father who created you together and as one. See what proves otherwise and you deny your whole reality. But grant that everything that seems to stand between you, keeping you from each other and separate from your father you made in secret and the instant of release has come to you. All its effects are gone because its source has been uncovered. It is its seeming independence of its source that keeps you prisoner. This is the same mistake as thinking you are independent of the source by which you were created and have never left. So this is the end of this section. I want to go back and read this little section that, it, uh, that we read earlier. Say only this, but mean it with no reservations, for here the power of salvation lies. 
And these are the three lines. I am responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. This is really critical to understand. And, and I, can under, I can anticipate that you have some resistance to the sentence, I am responsible for what I see. If your training is not solid, you will uh, be tempted to think that, uh, that what this is saying is that you are responsible for what has been created. And that's not what this is saying. So let's be very clear here. The responsibility, your responsibility lies in how you react to things around you. And that reaction is your sight. So I am responsible for what I see. Meaning, when you look at something, you are responsible for what you see, for how you see it. Does that make it clearer? So think of something perhaps that you saw on the news. Now, you're not responsible for the thing that happened. You didn't create the event that you witnessed in the news. But how you respond to that news, how you react, you are responsible for. You are responsible for what you see, not for what exists, but for what you see in that how you see it. Let's add the next line. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. So let's think of an event that you saw. that and because some things don't necessarily create feelings but think of an event where you witness something and where it drew up feelings in you a response an emotional response what most people don't understand is that you have control in that moment. You might see something and it will evoke anger initially. Your immediate reaction will be anger, perhaps. And again, we have to remember the dynamic of what's going on here. You have housing, you reside within your body. And your body has cellular memory. Your body has its own programming. And so the two of you combined, you're going to witness something that's disturbing. And perhaps the very first response will be one of anger. That is typically your ego's response. But you are not, as you know, you're not your ego. You are spirit inhabiting a housing that has ego as a tool. And so you, you have the ability to override whatever the knee-jerk response is of your housing. It requires being in the moment. It requires being conscious. 
And so assuming that you are in that moment, your first response might be anger, but then you bring this sentence into being. I choose the feelings I experience and I decide upon the goal I would achieve. Let's think of, uh, let's think of a simple example. I can think of, for example, a, a time when um, a grandchild did something that was not, um, wasn't appropriate for them to have done. After overcoming the initial a spark of anger that the housing may have uh, created. And once you work with this long enough, that initial reaction will stop, right? You will overcome your ego's hardwiring with conscious thought. And so what do we choose in that moment? We know as a loving adult, that lashing out at our grandchildren about something that they did, that's, that's not gonna solve any problems. That's going, not going to teach them anything we want to teach them. So in that moment, we choose, we choose our feelings. I'm not going to choose to be angry with you. I'm going to instantly shift that. And I'm going to decide upon the goal that I really want. What do we want to achieve in the moment? Where do we want to end up? And then we respond in that way. Now let's talk about this third sentence here. And everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. I can anticipate there's a fair amount of resistance to this sentence as well. Things happen. We perceive to us. And, and, in, and we don't perceive that we've asked for them to happen. We don't. But what we need to understand is that the life that we are living is the life that divinity would have us live. And so the way I deal with this sentence here and everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked. I, I look at the things that happen as being the natural outcome of the moment. And as such, I accept them in the moment. I may not understand them in the moment, but I accept them nonetheless. And I can give you a real life example of this. In 2012, I had a hip replacement. My, I had my left hip replaced. And it was winter time, it was February. And as a part of my recovery, I was walking to the beach. I lived near the beach. I was walking to the beach twice a day. And we had just returned from our morning walk 
when a, a very unusual event occurred. I didn't trip, but something happened. And it, it was not, uh, it, it was definitely an, an intervention of some kind. Um, I caught my toe on a piece of frozen ice and I ended up being lifted up and, and sort of flying through the air. And as I'm flying through the air, I had the time to say, oh no, oh no, oh no. Three times I was able to say, oh no, before I hit the ground. And when I hit the ground, I discovered that I couldn't get back up. Nothing on my left side worked. I had no control over my left leg. Did I cry? No. Did I yell? No. Was I angry? No. I laid there and I thought, well, isn't this interesting? I wonder what this is about. So even though uh, I didn't have this sentence in my head and everything that seems to happen to me, I ask for and receive as I have asked, that is how I responded. In any given moment, life is a gift. And although we may not understand in what way we asked for the gift we've been given, we don't need to get too hung up on that part of the sentence. The most important thing is to, is to receive as, as if you had asked. and understand that it is being gifted to you as an opportunity. There is nothing that happens in your life that it doesn't happen as an opportunity. And so I guess I'll leave that uh, as my way of closing for this uh, particular section of um, or this particular, yeah, this section of uh, chapter 21. The responsibility for sight. It truly means taking responsibility for what you choose to see, how you choose to see events. So I hope my additional uh, sharing has been helpful. If you would like additional support, you can reach out to me. Uh, texting is best, 907-491. No, sorry, that's definitely not the right number. So texting is best if you're using this number I'm going to give you of the two choices you would have, calling or texting. 907-351-3003. Uh, that's the correct number. You can also message me through uh, Facebook, Love by Light uh, group, or you can face uh, uh, through, uh, sorry, YouTube, uh, where you find this, or through SoundCloud. You can also visit my websites. lindalamp.com is the main website, and you can contact me through that site. And you can also visit my uh, store, lindalamp.shop. And that's where I have uh, books and uh, uh, coaching and all kinds of other things available. You can also sign up to be a light sponsor um, to help uh, contribute to the funding that keeps me going here. So thank you again. Um, I will be posting these uh, every Sunday as, as I can. Um, 
can't promise there won't be an interruption, but uh, it's a new year and, and it is my intention to work our way through each Sunday, the rest of these chapters and sections until we finish A Course in Miracles. Don't forget, I also did the complete daily uh, lessons and you can look for those on YouTube and SoundCloud and Facebook or message me and I can put you in touch with them if you'd like to start with the daily lessons. And one of these days, I do promise I'll be back on camera. Um, I've been dealing with some technical things and um, I was hoping I was going to live stream this one today, but I'm not quite ready. So uh, stand by for that. In the meantime, thank you again for joining me and um, namaste, much love. <laughs>